Hello everyone, welcome back. Today is going to be a big one. Almost everything we have done in fluid dynamics up to this point is going to culminate with Bernoulli's equation. In fact, it is so important and encompassing that there is no way you're getting through the AP exam without it being assessed in great detail. And because of that, I'm going to take this video and do nothing but really introduce the equation, where it came from, and how it will be used to make sure you understand every part of it. And part of the reason for that is Bernoulli's equation is actually a bit of a jump to an earlier, much more powerful topic. Bernoulli's equation isn't technically about fluids. It's about energy. And if we're going to talk energy, we need to bring up the single most important energy rule in the universe. And that is this. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. In other words, energy is conserved. As long as you have a closed system, the amount of energy you start with has to equal the amount of energy you end up with. Now you may ask, what does that have to do with fluids and pressure? Well, let's have that conversation right now. To start with, this is a fire extinguisher. Inside this canister is basically a fluid or foam. You can also talk about it in terms of being a gas, but the important thing is the fact that it is under pressure. In other words, the pressure in this canister is definitely much higher than the atmospheric pressure outside. Now, if you were to pull the trigger on this canister, it actually opens a valve that allows an open path between the canister and the hose. When that happens, the pressure tries to normalize with the atmospheric pressure and pushes out the foam and actually accelerates the foam from rest, which is going to be important. Taking that same idea, here is a paintball gun. So a paintball fires little round balls full of paint that are not pictured here. But the important thing is, here is the canister that is under high pressure. When the player pulls the trigger, again, it opens a path from the canister to the barrel. Again, the pressure will try to normalize, and if there is a paintball ready to go in the barrel, that paintball will be fired out of the barrel. So the concept on how a paintball gun works and how a fire extinguisher works is essentially the same. Both have a canister under pressure and both use the energy stored in that canister to actually accelerate a mass and give it a high velocity upon exit. Now to help get the point across, I'm actually going to use the paintball example, but I'm going to simplify it. So here's my simplified version of the paintball example. I have my canister under high pressure. I have a valve here. Uh, instead of just the ball, I'm going to have a piston right here and then the ball. So to give you a little better view, this is kind of what it looks like in 3D. Canister under high pressure, valve, and the reason why I wanted to add the piston is just to show that the pressure is being exerted over this area, which is a perfect circle. What I'm shading right now, that's the area I'm talking about. If there is a force or pressure exerted on that area, then the whole thing gets shot out of the barrel. Now, here's the important note we're going to be discussing. At this point right here, the velocity of the ball is zero meters per second. However, when it accelerates to get shot out, it obviously has a final velocity well above zero meters per second. And if it is doing that, then it is gaining kinetic energy. Because if you remember the kinetic energy equation, it is one half mv squared. Velocity starts at zero. We have a larger final velocity, so it is obviously gaining kinetic energy. Now, the big question is, where is that energy coming from? Now, based on the fire extinguisher and paintball gun, you probably have already have a good understanding that the energy is stored in this high pressure canister. Well, how does that relate mathematically? Let's see if I can give you a good mental image here. All right, so this canister is under high pressure. I lift the piston. That high pressure then expands and pushes onto this area. Now, that piston is then pushed a certain distance this way. And I'm going to simply call that distance or displacement make that delta x. Now, if this was just a single point force moving that distance, I would have force times displacement. But it's not just a point force. I have a force exerted over this entire area. So I have a pressure 
And if that pressure is pushing that piston over this displacement, and I was to make a 3D image of that movement, it would look like this. I would have that pressure exerted here over an area, and that entire area would be moved this entire distance. Well, if I take a look at that, pressure times area times displacement, I would get I would get pressure exerted over a volume. Now, let me actually back up a step because pressure we have right down here. Pressure is force over area. And I literally just condense volume, which was area times delta x. Well, if I do that, these areas both cancel. And if I do that, I get force times displacement. And not only that, this force is parallel because it's exerted on the area to the right, and it's parallel to the displacement, which is also to the right. Bonus round, where have you seen force times displacement before? If you just said work, then you are correct, which is a proof that pressure times change in volume is a transfer of energy, which also means pressure stored in a volume is stored energy because literally it is basically energy ready to go. This energy stored in this volume is ready to expand to a greater volume. So how much energy is stored in here? It's the pressure times the volume of this container. And a side note, this is technically gauge pressure because we're basically pretending the outside pressure is zero. I want to make sure to say this because it is typically not directly stated. However, think of it like this for my paintball gun. If I want to increase how much energy my canister has, how can I do it? Well, there are two ways. One is to increase the pressure in the canister. That's just fine, although there are regulations, obviously, for safety, stating how high the pressure can be. Another option is to simply get a bigger canister. If I double the size of this canister and have the same pressure, that means you have twice the amount of energy stored in the canister. That is why you can actually find different size canisters. A player obviously doesn't want it to be too big because then they have to carry it around. All right, so to make this very clear, pressure times volume equals energy. And it's stored potential energy. I'm just gonna call it UP. So it matches our other potential energy labels. I'm gonna take that and put that up here on the right. So pressure times volume, is a stored type of energy, which in our paintball situation became kinetic. Now, let me show you another situation that's kind of similar. Here I have a pipe. I have a fluid going through here, which I'll just call section one, rises through here, and is moving through here, which I'll call section two. Now, the pipe has a uniform radius. If I take a quick look at the last formula we derived, if the pipe has a uniform radius, that means the pipe has a uniform cross-sectional area. If the pipe has the same cross-sectional area in one and two, that means the velocity does not change. So whatever the velocity is here, the velocity is also equal here. So there's no change in kinetic energy. However, if this is my height line, I'm going to make this zero meters. Because when in doubt, always make the lowest point in the problem your base. Now, if you notice, I chose the center of the pipe, not the bottom of the pipe. That's because on average, the lowest level of fluid in the pipe is dead center because I have some up here and some down here. The same thing is gonna be true for the top of the pipe. So some is gonna be up here, some is gonna be down here. The average is gonna be here. So this line represents my height final. Again, dead center of the pipe. Now we just said the velocity does not change which means you have no increase in kinetic energy. However, we do have a change in height. And if we have a change in height, we have a change in gravitational potential energy, MGH. So if we have an increase in gravitational potential energy, the question then becomes, again, where did the energy come from? Well, the energy comes from the fact that the water is under pressure. And we also have to talk about the fact that fluid is not like the marble in the last problem. It's not a solid object. We're not talking about a single object that has mass. We're talking about a constantly moving fluid. So what we're going to discuss 
is a certain volume of that fluid. In other words, if I take a look at this volume here, that little box I made, I continuously have fluid moving through it. If I say that each side is one meter and I take my density equation here, that means the mass inside this box would be density times volume. If this was water, it would be density 1000 kilograms meters cubed times one meter cubed, 111. So the mass inside that box would be 1000 kilograms. If I take a look at the same size cube right here, at the same time, I have the exact same amount of fluid going through it with the exact same density. Therefore, this would also have 1000 kilograms of material inside it going at the exact same velocity. Therefore, the kinetic energy here and the kinetic energy here would be the same. Now, here's the point. We are not going to discuss this in terms of mass. Instead, we're going to discuss this in terms of mass per unit volume. You can think about it in terms of mass per meter cubed. How much mass is in that imaginary piece of volume? And this, of course, comes down to my equation down here, which is density. So if we are talking about energy, not in terms of mass, but in terms of mass per unit volume, we now have this. Gravitational energy per unit volume equals mgh over volume which is rho gh, because mass over volume, again, is density. Kinetic energy over volume is 1 half mv squared over volume, which is 1 half rho v squared. And last but not least, we just derived that pressure times volume is a type of stored energy. Therefore, if I just divide both sides by volume, I have that stored energy over volume equals pressure. So pressure is not energy. Pressure is energy over unit volume. You can kind of think of it as an elastic potential energy because it's not all that much different. If you have a fire extinguisher under high pressure and open up that valve, that pressure is going to do work and push that foam, or in the case of the paintball gun, push that paintball out the nozzle. So we now have three types of energy we're dealing with, or better stated, energy per unit volume, gravitational, kinetic, and pressure. If we combine that, with one of the most important laws in the universe, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, we then have this. In this system, you have three types of energy. Pressure energy, which I called UP, kinetic energy, and gravitational potential energy. One way to state this is they must all equal a constant. In other words, if you gain kinetic, you must lose something else. In the case of the paintball gun, if you gain kinetic, you lose pressure. Once the pressure in that canister is depleted, then you're not shooting paintballs anymore. In the example I just had with the pipe, that fluid was gaining gravitational potential energy. And we literally said velocity was not changing, so the kinetic was not changing. If it was gaining gravitational, what was it losing? Well, it was losing pressure. And spoiler alert, yes, this does have a relationship with our pressure at depth equation that we actually derived much earlier. Don't forget, technically, this isn't height height, it's depth. It's how far beneath the water line that your point is that you are looking at. This is height to the surface, which is not to be confused with this one, which is very literal height. If you don't understand what I just said, don't worry about it. I'm going to show you probably one of my next few videos when we start doing examples. However, for now, there is a much more common way to write this equation, and it looks like this. In your system, you have point one, and you have point two. Any energy gained from point one to point two must equal energy lost from point one to point two. In other words, energy is conserved. In this situation right here, kinetic energy is the same. These two parts would cancel. In my situation with the pipe here, we already said kinetic energy is the same, no change in velocity. We also said that the lowest point here is zero meters. So on the initial side, I have zero gravitational. The fluid gains height, which means a gain in gravitational potential energy on the right-hand side. Well, if it gains gravitational, it must lose something, and what it lost is pressure, which means the pressure at point one has to be higher than the pressure at point two. And again, it's no accident that our pressure at depth equation is rho gh, because if you were to substitute that here, basically what it would come down to is the change in height, if you were looking for pressure one. So let's bring back our thick to thin pipe just to show you another quick example. It's velocity one, that's velocity two. And we already figured out that the velocity one is less than velocity two. 
And to do that, we used our area times velocity equation down here. If the cross-sectional area decreases, then the velocity must increase. If the velocity increases, that means we have an increase in kinetic energy on this side. As far as gravitational is concerned, the center of the pipe does not change height. So on average, there's no increase or decrease in gravitational potential energy. So no change in gravitational. And if I have an increase in kinetic energy, where did that energy come from? Well, that energy, or energy per unit volume, I should say, came from pressure. Because if you remember in the last video, we already stated that the fluid in the wider tube that is moving slower is going to be under higher pressure. So going from one to two here, pressure decreases and kinetic energy increases. That's the trade-off. And again, the rule is energy is conserved. The only difference is just talking about energy per unit volume because you're talking about a fluid that is continuously moving. These are not static situations anymore. All right, so this is where Bernoulli's equation came from, why it exists, and a little taste of how it's going to be used. Over the next video or two, I will do some very specific examples that should help clear up any confusion you have. All right, so I'm going to end it here. Have a good day. This is Mr. M signing off.